So, good day again class. So, we'll resume with our mechanical properties lecture. So, now we go into our stress strain curves. Again, ito ang itsura ng stress strain curve natin. Stress sa y-axis. This is stress and strain sa x-axis. So, again, stress is sigma and strain is epsilon. So, makita natin dito yung dalawang regions natin. You have your elastic region here and your plastic region here. So, from this stress strain curve, again, makakuha tayo ng iba't ibang features na makita natin in the next few slides. Or makita natin dito. So, tingnan nyo lang siya. So, first, one of the more important things that we we'll learn from our stress strain curve is your modulus of elasticity. We also call this the stiffness of your material. The modulus of elasticity, this is the proportionality constant between your stress and your strain. So in the elastic region of our stress-strain diagram, we consider that the relationship between the stress and the strain of your material is linear. Thus, we have this linear uh, equation relating stress and strain. So we also know this modulus of elasticity as your Young's modulus. Stiffness nga siya. So, pag mataas yung elasticity mo, it means it's more stiff, mas malaki yung stress na kailangan mo para ma-elongate mo ang isang bagay. Pag mababa yung modulus elasticity, konting stress lang mag-elongate na yung bagay natin. So, the modulus elasticity, this is related to the bond energy of the material. So, for simplicity, uh, pag mas mataas ang bond energy ng material mo, ina-expect natin, mas mataas yung elastic modulus niya. Since mas mahirap i-extend yung bonds natin sa isa't isa, mas mataas yung stress na kailangan para magkaroon ng deformation yung ating material. So your modulus elasticity E, it's a function of your bond strength. It's directly, it's proportional to your bond strength. For temperature, habang tumataas naman ang temperature mo, habang tumataas ang temperature mo, ang trend is bababa si modulus of elasticity. So, when you consider the bond energies of our different materials, makita natin that your ceramics would have the highest uh, modulus of elasticity followed by your metals then your polymers. Makita natin yan in your real materials. Mas madali natin na stretch ang mga polymers natin than your metals and your ceramics. So, it just has something to do with their bond energies, their bond strengths. So we also have what we call your yield strength. The yield strength is the stress applied to the material or the amount of stress you need to apply to a material to cause plastic deformation. So dun sa unang part, habang in-extend mo siya, uh, elastic pa lang deformation nun. But unto some point in which hindi na kaya mag-stretch ng bonds, magkakaroon ka na ng mga slip, mga deformation natin, you will lead now to plastic deformation. So dito na tumapasok yung yield strength natin. So, yung stress strain curve natin, usually, hindi madaling makita yung uh, kung saan tumitigil yung linearity nung ating uh, elastic region. So, what we do is we provide a strain offset depending on the class of the material. So, for metals, is 0.002. So, ceramics yan yung ginagamit. And for polymers, it's 0.02. So, we provide an offset. So, let's say ito. Mag-offset tayo ng gintong strain, kukuha tayo ng tangent dun sa line na to at zero, the trace natin hanggang tumama tayo dun sa stress, mag-intersect siya dun sa stress strain diagram. So that would be your yield strength for your material. For some materials, makita natin meron kang upper and lower yield point. So yung lower yield point natin, yan yung tinatawag na, yan yung kinoconsider naman nating yield stress for materials that exhibit this kind of behavior. So, in terms of the monolithic materials, we can rank their yield strength as we can dun sa modulus of elasticity. So, now you know na yung yield strength natin medyo related dyan sa bond strength. So, you would have an idea that your ceramic would have the higher yield strength followed by your metals. Then lastly, yung polymers natin. So, we also have what we call your modulus of resilience or UR. 
Resilience is the capacity of the material to absorb energy upon elastic deformation, or basically the amount of energy na absorb niya bago siya magplastically deform. So it's just the area under the elastic curve. You use the integral to so integrate stress with respect to strain from zero to the yield strain. Or since alam natin, or we can approximate this area as a triangle, since linear naman yung relationship ni stress and strain, we can just approximate this area here as a triangle. We have this formula here. So this is just one half height times base. Triangle. Triangle. So area nito. Approximation siya. Now we go into what we call your tensile strength or your ultimate tensile strength. So pag sinasabi natin na strength ng material natin, usually ito yung refer nila yung tensile strength or ultimate tensile strength ng material. So this is the maximum stress that your material can withstand. That, yeah, yun, na. yun yung maximum stress na kayang ma-withstand ng yung material. So, after niya ma-reach itong ultimate tensile strength natin, mag-neck na yung material mo. So, magkakaroon na tayo ng necking region sa material. So, dito, yung ultimate tensile strength natin is this region here. This is UTS. Since ito yung pinakamataas na stress mo. So, simple. Ultimate tensile strength, highest tensile strength, highest stress na kaya niyang ma-withstand. Lastly, we have your fracture strength. This is the stress at fracture, it is ito. So, kung ano yung reading ng stress dyan, ito yung fracture strength mo. So, per a perfect material, yung theoretical strength niya, or yung tensile strength, or fracture strength ng material na yun, if it has no defects, would be one-tenth of the elastic modulus. But, there is no such thing as a perfect material. Every material that we have on earth has inherent defects. One of those defects are what we call your cracks. So, the fracture strength or the strength of your material, this is affected by the presence of defects inside your material. So, these defects may be your cracks, your pores, your notches, your inclusions, and so on. So, the presence of, let's say, a crack inside the material would lead to Amplification, amplification of the stress received at the tip of the crack. Makita natin dito, habang lumalapit tayo sa crack natin, tumataas yung stress na na-experience -re talaga nung crack tip natin kumpara dun sa stress na na-experience nung rest of the material mo. Since makita natin sa crack mo, if this is the bonds, dito sa material na to, nasasalo yung stress dito. Pagdating mo dito, dito may hiwa ka na, hindi na nasasalo ng area na to yung stress na to. So, mangyari, yung stress na na-apply dito sa crack region na to, sasaluhin siya nung crack tip mo. Ito yung mag amplify sa kanya, mas mataas yung stress na may experience niya in that corner or that tip. So, for the fracture of a material, it goes through stages. So, A, you have necking. So, magkakaroon ka ng neck region. So, magkakaroon ka ng localized plastic deformation in which liliit yung cross-sectional area at the neck. Next, will form voids in your material. Voids. Then, these voids will coalesce into a crack. Then, these cracks will propagate until tumama siya sa dulo and magkakaroon tayo ng fracture. So another property that we can get from the stress strain diagram is what we call your ductility. Ductility is just the maximum plastic deformation that your material can withstand before failure. So we call your materials brittle if they do not plastically deform or there's little to no plastic deformation before they fracture. So, kaya yung paperclip mo, ductile yan, kasi pwede natin siyang hilahilahin nang hindi agad siya masisira. Yung plastic mo, ductile yan. Yung ceramic mo, kunyari, you have a ceramic brick or ceramic tile. Pag hinila mo yan, mag-fracture yan bago siya mag-plastically deform. 
So for ductility, we have different um, measures. You have percent elongation and percent reduction in area. So for both, this is just basically delta or the change in the length or the area over the initial length or area times 100%. So, nakita nila, for most materials, there's a relationship between the ductility and the temperature of your material. For metals, habang tumataas yung temperature mo, if you increase your temperature, they find that you have increased ductility. So, habang tumataas yung temperature, tumataas yung ductility natin. So, this is what caused one of the causes of the wreckage of the Titanic. So, ang Titanic nyo, nag-crash siya, uh, nag nasira siya, kasi tumama siya sa iceberg. Pero alam nyo yun. Pero, kaya siya nasira agad, kaya nabuwarak agad yung ship, rather than magdent lang yung hull ng ship natin, is because yung steel na ginagamit nila for their cruise or for their ship, was brittle in that operating temperature. Hindi nila account yun na may ductile to brittle transition pala na maging brittle yung steel nila doon. Kaya nung numama sila sa iceberg, nag-crack yung hole nila. Kaya yun, namatay si Jack, pati si Rose. Yata. Hindi ko pa naman pala ng Titanic. And another important property of your materials is your toughness. So, kanina meron tayong resilience is the area under the elastic region. Yung toughness natin is just the area under the whole stress-strain curve. Because your toughness is the ability of a material to absorb energy and plastically deform before fracturing. So, again, yung area between the stress uh, under the stress-strain diagram that is just a measure of the energy absorbed by your material. So, makita natin for your toughness, uh, usually, brittle materials are not tough. So, ceramics have high strength. Ceramics have high strength, but they have little toughness since yung brittle, uh, yung ductility nila is mababa. Also, for your polymers, for unreinforced polymers, mababa rin yung toughness nila since yung strength nila is mababa lang. Even though mataas yung strain na kaya nilang ma-absorb. So generally, ang pinaka-tough natin na material is your metals because they have the combination of the high stress and high strain needed to have higher energy absorbed before fracturing. So recap lang tayo ng ating stress-strain diagram. So from the stress-strain diagram, you can find the following information. So yung elastic modulus natin, this is the slope of your stress-strain diagram. Ito siya. Resilience is this area here, yung area under the stress strain, uh, the elastic region. Yield strength is this, or the strength of the material, the stress uh, experience before plastically deforming. The UTS is the highest stress na kaya ng material. Fracture strength mo is yung stress at fracture. Toughness is the area under kailangan pala may highlighter. Under this curve. So, hanggang fracture. Ito yung toughness mo. And yung ductility mo. Ductility. This is the strain at fracture. So, yan. At least, alam nyo na siya. So, you are now officially materials engineer students. Congratulations. So, for our previous discussions, we have been talking about your crystalline materials, uh, mga metals and ceramics, now we look at how deformation happens in other materials na amorphous such as your glasses and your polymers. So first, let's look at the deformation in our glasses. So a glass is an amorphous uh, ceramic. This, they are very brittle. And the deformation of our glasses is through viscous flow. Think uh, how honey flows. Parang ganun yung deformation niya. Parang tubig, uh, viscosity, nagpo-flow siya. Hindi siya through slip or through twinning. So, parang matawag natin na parang liquid yung glass natin. So, super hypercritical liquid yata yung sinasabi sa glass or something. 
So viscous flow is the measure, uh, viscosity is the measure of a non-crystalline material's resistance to flow. So ito lang yung measure kung gaano kalapot yung material natin. So this involves the sliding of atoms past one another under the action of a stress. So yan, viscosity. So the resistance to this sliding or this viscosity Viscosity then is a function of the bond strength of your material. If the bond strength is high, you would expect that the viscosity of your material would be high. Malapot siya, mahirap siyang ipa-flow. So viscosity depends on temperature. So take for example our glass. Glass ay napaka-viscous at normal temperatures. So let's say this is Room temperature. This is room temperature. In room temperature, your glass does not flow. Tintawag natin, glassy siya. But as you increase your temperature, as we increase your temperature, makita natin that your viscosity would decrease. And after a while, kakaroon tayo ng tinatawag natin glass transition. And the modulus or the viscosity of your material would decrease such that we can work on the glass. And upon further increase, pwede pa tayo natin mapabehave yung glass natin as if it is a liquid. So note here, this region in which nagkakaroon tayo ng appreciable drop or malaking drop in the modulus or the viscosity of your material is what we call your glass transition. The glass transition temperature as transition temperature is a temperature in which this happens and this is only evident in your amorphous structures. This is important because this demarcates the line between your material acting as if it is a hard brittle material or a soft rubbery material or a liquid flowy material. So for glasses, this is important since makita natin kung hanggang saan ba maging applicable yung glass mo. Ayaw naman natin magkaroon ng glass, di ba, na nagpo-flow siya or hindi siya nag hold ng shape niya. So, we usually put our glasses in applications lower than the glass transition temperature. Glass in glass. And kaya, pag nag-glass work tayo, if nanonood kayo ng Discovery Channel or nanonood kayo sa YouTube, lagi nilang heat up yung glass bago nilang shape Since we're overcoming the glass transition temperature para mas madali mag-flow yung ating material. So given what you have just learned regarding viscosity, you can answer this question. Why is glass brittle? So pakipause muna ng video and sagutan niyo na on your own or isigaw niyo sa screen niyo. Correct. So <laughs> glass is brittle because again, amorphous structures deformed by viscous flow and at room temperature yung glass natin is very viscous and therefore uh, hindi siya nagpo-flow. So, mahirap yung plastic deformation niya. Mas madali siyang mag-fracture na lang kaysa mag-move about yung atoms mo. So, yun. So, mataas viscosity, mahirap siyang i-break. Mahirap kang mag-plastically deform. It would rather fracture. So, other considerations for the strength of ceramics. Uh, the strength of ceramics are usually load dependent. By that, we mean mas mataas yung strength ng ceramics mo under compression than in tension. Though, some processes will help in that. So, for example, tempering of glasses, this can improve the toughness of your material. Also, the strength of our ceramics or of our glasses, this is adversely affected by the presence of impurities or defects in the structure. Like other materials, if there are voids, pores, and cracks in your material or in your glass, this would cause it to break more easily. So now let's look at the deformation of our polymers. So again, polymers are usually amorphous or semi-crystalline in nature. So there are, these are just some uh, common stress-strain diagrams of your polymers. So pwede siyang maging brittle, as in A. Pwede siyang tinatawag natin na plastic. So you have an elastic and a high ductility. Or you have an elastomeric curve in which tumataas yung stress na 
kaya niya ma-withstand until mag-fracture siya. And sa elastomeric mo, kaya siya tinawag na elastomeric, it has a high or long elastic region. So, hanggang dito yung elastic region mo. So, for the elastic deformation of polymers, this usually happens at smaller strains of our polymers. This shows linear elastic behavior um, following this equation or stress equal to E times strain. E is the elastic modulus or the Young's modulus. This is caused by the bond angle deformation and the bond stretching of your polymers. But these uh, deformations are recoverable. So, pag tinanggal mo yung stress, babalik siya sa original position mo. Kaya wala tayong permanent deformation. Thus, it is elastic. At further strain, strain-induced softening occurs. This reduces the modulus of your material. So, the modulus is just the slope of stress versus strain. And this is attributed to the uncoiling and straightening of your chains. So, the strain-induced softening, this is usually the start of the plastic deformation. Ito na transition mo from elastic to plastic deformation. So, meanwhile, we have here your plastic deformation. So, plastic deformation happens at larger strains, at strains higher than the yield point. Uh, first, there is yielding. So, yielding is the slippage of polymer chains past one another. This is only partially recoverable since basically nag-iba na yung positions ng polymer chains natin. Nag-overtake -over na iba, hindi na natin siya kayang ma-recover fully. Then, we have your necking. So, sa necking mo, chain extension reduces the area of your polymer. So, think of your polymer as if spaghetti siya. Pag sinetch mo siya, mag-a-align mag -align yung polymer chains mo. And dahil sa pag-align na yun, liliit yung area nung ating region na yun. So, magkakaroon ka ng parang neck in that region. Then, you would have strain hardening. Strain hardening is when all of your chains are now fully aligned. So, mas mahirap nang i-deform yung material mo. Kasi mahirap, mahirap i-extend rather than i-uncoil lang yung mga chains mo. So, tataas yung stress na kayang ma-withstand ng material mo until it... So, for polymers like glass, they also deform via viscous flow. So, for polymers, the factors affecting the strength of your polymer are the following. You have temperature, molecular weight. The van der Waals or intermolecular forces in between your polymer chains and whether or not your polymers are cross-linked or a covalent network or kung hindi sila nagka cross -link. So first for temperature, uh, analogous with glass, if your temperature increases, the viscosity of your polymer will decrease and it will be easier to flow. Pag easier to flow siya, weaker yung polymer mo. Since mula sa rigid, brittle material, magiging rubbery or liquid, flowy material ka. So, obvious naman kung sino dun yung stronger. Next, you have your molecular weight. As you increase your molecular weight, you will generally have an increase in the molecular, in the, sorry, in the strength of your polymer. But, this would lead to an asymptotic value as habang tinataas mo pa yung molecular weight mo. So, meron lang limit ng strength yung polymer mo. So, initially, mataas yung increase with increase in molecular weight. But as you increase further, the strength of the polymer does not increase that much anymore. So, in processing or in the production of polymers, usually, hinahanap natin yung sweet spot in which merong acceptable na strength yung polymer, pero hindi siya ganun kahaba. Kasi habang pinapahaba mo yung polymer mo, habang pinapalaki mo yung molecular weight niya, mas matagal yung processing na kailangan mo. Baka hindi na effective cost-wise yung process mo. So, we also have your van der Waals forces. So, looking back at the crystallinity of your polymers, discuss natin itong van der Waals mo. So, if you have stronger intermolecular forces in between your polymers, generally, mas stronger yung polymer mo. Since mas mahirap 
ma misalign yung chains or mas mahirap ma pull apart yung chains mo if mas malakas yung forces in between them, leading to a higher strength. So for example, you have your Kevlar or polyacrylamide. So polyacrylamide has this kind of structure. Nakita natin dito you have ito and ito. These are examples of H bonding. Due to this H bonding, malakas yung intermolecular force between your Kevlar, making it a strong polymer. So yan, kaya ginagamit siya in your uh, bulletproof outfits and other technical applications. And lastly, if you have cross-linking or if network, if cross-link or network yung yung polymer, you expect na mas mataas yung strength mo since merong binds or meron kang linkages na nagpre-prevent ng motion ng iyong polymers. So, pag nagpre-prevent yung motion ng polymers mo, you like slip past one another, mas mataas yung strength ng polymers mo. Now, let's look at semi-crystalline polymers. So, semi-crystalline polymers natin, these are polymers that exhibit both crystalline and amorphous phases in their structure. So, the factors affecting the strength of these semi-crystalline polymers would be the crystallinity and the temperature. So, in-expect natin, pag mas mataas yung crystallinity ng polymer mo, tataas yung strength ng polymer mo. So, increasing the crystallinity would increase the strength of your polymer. Since crystalline or crystallites or yung crystalline regions natin sa polymers mo, these act as if they are physical cross-links or basically they bind our chains together. Mas maraming crystalline region mo, mas magiging well, mas magiging stronger yung polymer mo. Another important um, consideration is temperature. Since recall, semi-crystalline lang naman yung polymer mo, meron ka pa rin amorphous region dyan. Since meron ka pa rin amorphous region, your polymer will still undergo viscous flow. Even though semi-crystalline siya, meron ka pa rin amorphous region that might flow under elevated temperature. And this would lower so, if you increase the temperature, this would lower the strength of your polymer. So, with that, this is the end of our mechanical properties lecture for Math E21. So, for any questions or comments, you can put it down below. You can message me through Uvle, through email, or through my cell phone. Sasagot naman ako, kailangan ko na mag-load kasi mahirap magpa-load. Also, uh, please stay sane. I don't expect you to be in the tip-top shape kasi kahit ako, nabuburingan na ako sa bahay. But, kaya natin to, I guess. And hope to see you soon, healthy, and hope your family is all healthy as well. Sa so, friends nila, lahat na lang sana. Sana matapos na to, please. Ayoko <laughs> sa bahay. Anyways, bye-bye. Uh, Thank you.